Okay, I'm just looking at the slides for it to be on the first one. Okay, salam alaikum everyone. Thank you for joining us once again for our series lecture hosted by MICA organization. Very soon the session will start. So while we wait for other people to join, kindly have your pad and your pens with you. Um, briefly, we're just going to talk about um, MICA for those who are attending for the first time. MICA is Movement for Islamic Culture and Awareness. Now, MICA started in 1994 as a result of direct resolution of the Form 1 Youth Dinner. The aim of MICA is to provide a safe space for young Muslims and to be a forefront in providing quality training in leadership. Creating avenue for Muslim males and females to meet and possibly get married is also part of the agenda. Now, the key vision here for MICA is to see Muslims return to a state of Islamic excellence. And they hope to attain this, to achieve this by creating an awareness of Islam and impact Islamic culture and values on the Muslim for the improvement of contemporary society and the cause of Allah. Now, we encourage people to become members of MICA. Part of the reasons are because MICA delivers programs, of pro programs and projects by feeding the soul of the individual, providing safe space, economic development, leadership and competency training, capacity building, as well as helping to build passion for the dean and pos positive social interactions and other things. So we really do hope that through this, more people will be better individuals. Now to become a, to become a member, all you need to do is request the form, either soft copy or hard copy. And we have a membership fee of 5,000 Naira minimum contribution. Only members will be entitled to special benefits, which uh, MICA offers. So we do encourage particip participants to become members of MICA. Now, we have other upcoming events. After these um, wonderful series on emotional intelligence, our upcoming series has to do with unlocking your potential, beginning the 28th of June through to the 12th of July, 2020. And only registered participants will get an opportunity to join the registration, the um, session. So make sure you register for the program so you don't get locked out. Here we have our account balance for those who want to give anything out of their, you know, free will, obviously. Please do help contribute towards MICA. Now, for this session, we have some ground rules we expect everyone to adhere to. This includes, but not limited to muting your mic when not speaking. Raise your hands when you need to say something. There is actually something you can click on Zoom. We don't mean raising your hands on the screen. You just have to click there that you need to you know, ask a question. Show your face, start your video, if you feel comfortable with that. And also use the chat to ask for help. If you have any problems with the sound or the video, please let us know. And don't panic if you have a error in connection. Because after the lecture, we will hopefully share these um, with you if you are registered. Thank you very much. Now for this series, we have with us Hadia Habiba Balogun. She is an organization effectiveness consultant, a certified leadership coach with over about 28 years experience. She's multilingual and speaks six languages. She holds a bachelor's degree in French, Italian, and Italian from the University of London a master's degree in organizational management, including leadership coaching and team facilitation from George Washington University, Washington DC, and is also an alumni of Harvard Business School, executive education in strategic leadership. She has delivered several lectures and trainings for MICA and also Association of Model Islamic Schools, Lotus Capital, and much more. Thank you very much, Ma, for um, doing this for us today. Her consultation relies on two main methodologies, accelerated learning, which trains adults in ways that enjoy learning, and neuro-linguistic programming, the, service, um, the science of observing and modeling the best practices of successful people and organizations. For those who are coming for the first time, we welcome you and would like to proceed with our Zoom meeting. Thank you very much, Ma. Hey, so thank you so much, Kubra. 
Assalamu alaikum to everyone who's joined us today. I'm delighted to have you back on this, our third in a three-part series on success through emotional intelligence, the science of being a successful person. Um, so today we're focusing on moving forward with emotional intelligence. Um, I know not everybody would have been with us in the first two, so I will do a quick recap. But today is about actually learning how to improve and increase your emotional intelligence. Um, as, as with the other two in the series, I'm going to be focusing on Daniel Goleman's framework, the framework he came up with for emotional intelligence, um, including his uh, new how to be a leader through emotional intelligence as well. So the rationale, let me just recap on the rationale. Why this topic? It's because emotional intelligence has been proven to contribute more to achievement and success than technical skills. So your technical skills, your IQ, your intelligence quotient are very important. Never think that emotional intelligence is saying that is not important. That's the, that's the foundation. But emotional intelligence on top of, in addition to complementing your technical skills and your IQ contributes more to achievement and success. And for those of you for whom happiness is more important, it also contributes to more overall happiness at home and at work. So our learning objectives to develop greater self-awareness and self-control, and we've been doing some exercises through these three weeks to help you de develop greater self-awareness and to learn how to control the amygdala hijack. That's to help you control your emotional responses. Uh, last week, we spent a lot of time aligning emotional intelligence with Islam taking the example of the prophet, peace be upon him. This week, we're going to establish our motivations and start planning towards our goals. Um, identify your emotional strengths and areas for development and learn to respond to difficult people or difficult situations um, in a productive way. Just a recap of what we did. In the first week, we got to know each other, as get to, got to know ourselves and each other as cultural beings. We learned how different we are from everybody around us, including our siblings, um, and to appreciate that. We also became more conscious of our multiple identities, the fact that we're very complex human beings and how our backgrounds would lead us to see the world in a certain way and would have established our automatic reactions to certain situations, automatic reactions that sometimes lead us to making unwise decisions. We also learned to keep the broader context in mind when um, making decisions and when looking at life. You know, keep the broader, there's more to life than your life. There's more to the world than where the little part of the little corner that you occupy. So we put ourselves in a gratitude mindset, you know, appreciating what we have, being thankful for the blessings of Allah and using that to inspire us to grow and to recover and to control our fears. Um, last week, we looked at the prophet's uh, emotional intelligence. He was said to make people feel that they're the most important person to him, each person. He would understand people and their emotional states, and he would use that information to uplift, inspire, encourage, and create leaders. He would create leaders around him and he would fulfill the emotional needs of those around him. He even went beyond, beyond that and fulfilled their material needs. And what we discovered last week was that in practicing taqwa, God consciousness, we actually raise our own level of self-awareness. We get to know ourselves better the more we get to know Allah better and to stay, remain close to him. And we also gain the ability to control our emotions to become more patient, to be able to persevere, to persevere, um, sabr. And then we discussed the lack of empathy amongst Muslims and talked about how we, using the Prophet's example, you know, how to show empathy when engaging with Muslims, how to engage with them in such a way that we would invite them to Islam and speak to them from a place of love and kindness when we are making Corrections, corrections rather than harshness. 
So that's what we covered um, last week. So the other, just a recap again, because I know there will be some new joiners. So what is emotional intelligence? Emotional intelligence is we've been trained to use our brains to think and enhance our reasoning. Emotional intelligence is also using our emotions to think and enhance our reasoning and the capacity to be aware of and control and express those emotions so that we can have great and productive um, relationships. There are five competencies that have been outlined in Daniel Goleman's uh, emotional intelligence framework. They are self-awareness, knowing yourself very well, not lying to yourself, knowing your strengths, your weaknesses, your triggers, your likes, your dislikes. Self-regulation, being able to control your emotion, whether it's positive emotions like happiness or love, whether it's negative emotions like anger or fear, being able to control your emotions, stay in control and not let your emotions be in control of you. The third one, motivation, knowing where you're going, knowing your purpose, having a goal at any point in time, and then and allowing that to be your guidance, to be your guiding star. Um, knowing you know, what sort of life you want, not, not knowing what sort of afterlife you, you want, knowing, knowing where you're heading to. And that will guide you in when you're in sticky situations needing to make some decisions, being self-motivated, having empathy, being able to put yourself in the shoes of somebody else, see things from their own perspective, not depart from your perspective, but being able to see things from somebody else's perspective. And finally, social skills, the ability to engage with others and have good harmony and empathy and loving relationships with other people. Um, this just talks about the attributes of each of these um, competencies. With self-awareness, you gain more self-confidence. You don't take yourself too seriously. You're more realistic about what you can achieve and you can't achieve. With self-regulation, you're more trustworthy. You're more comfortable with ambiguity, which is critical right now. With COVID, with the economic downturn, with so many things going on in our world right now, we need to be comfort comfortable with ambiguity. This, this extended period of uncertainty is having mental health um, imp um, implications on all of us. It's really been a stress on everybody's mental health. If you are able to control your emotions, you'll become more comfortable with ambiguity, more open to change. And that, is, that will help you with coping with the situation that we're in right now. Self-motivation, you'll have a strong drive to achieve. You will always be optimistic in the face of failure because you know where you're going. You don't feel that where you are is where you're going to be for the rest of your life. You have a goal, you have a direction. Empathy to help you be sensitive to other people, be great in terms of customer service, be great in terms of servant leadership and social skills will give you great influence and persuasion skills, help you become effective in leading change and in building and leading teams. So these attributes, these emotional intelligence attributes are really critical. And you, you can see here, there's no academic competence here. It, the academic, it's assumed that you've tried to improve yourselves in terms of your education as much as you can. These are other skills that you need to develop in order to succeed. Um, and the first week too, we talked about the amygdala hijack. And this is very important in emotional intelligence because this is what helps you with self-control. So something happens to you, it's called the stimulus down here. It goes to your brain, your brain, the air traffic controller aspect of your brain processes what has happened and sends out two messages. One message this way, one message that way. The message to your feeling brain, which your amygdala gets there first. And your amygdala might decide this is an emergency situation, shut off your thinking brain and make you react with a fight or flight reflex. That is your automatic reaction, your unthinking reaction. But if you're able to just block that automatic reaction here, you would give the message enough time to get to your thinking brain and your thinking brain will process the situation. Your thinking brain will think about your goals, your aspirations and help you develop the wisest response, the wisest response 
to that situation. So we also looked at last week, different ways to just give yourself enough time here, enough for your thinking brain to engage. And, and so you can, make, you can make informed decisions and have informed responses rather than automatic reactions. So why should you care about emotional intelligence? IQ might help you get your job, but EQ will help you succeed at your job. And you need those social skills because more and more workplaces, you work in teams. So you have to be able to get on with other people. People with low emotional intelligence are not able to get on with other people. So to the extent that organizations are now testing for emotional intelligence, as part of their hiring processes. They've discovered that when they hire the person who's most technically proficient, that person might not be a person that others can work with. In fact, it might be a person that nobody wants to work with and you have high turnover. So they're, also, they're not just testing for technical proficiency now, they're also testing for emotional intelligence. It's a better predictor of your success. It helps you being, build stronger relationships. It helps you succeed at work. It helps you have happier employees if you're an employer, and it helps you be a happier employee if you are <laughs> and working for yourself. So how to become more emotionally intelligent? And this is what we closed with um, last week. You have to become more self-aware. So the first week we took an, M an EQ test, an emotional intelligence test. We will share the links for those of you who haven't taken them already. Last week we took an empathy test. Again, we'll share the link for those of you, know how emotionally intelligent you are, where the gaps are, what you need to work on. Check how, how much empathy you, are, you have. A lot of people think they're very high in empathy. And when they take the test, they discover that they, in fact, they're very low. It doesn't mean that you don't care about other people. You can't understand other people's perspectives. It just means that when they come to you with a problem, your first response is not to show empathy. And also practice taqwa, practice God consciousness, read the Quran, read the Hadith, read the Sirah, um, practice remembrance of Allah. In getting closer to him, you will get to learn more about yourself. Observe yourself more, learn to identify your emotions at any moment in time, be able to tell what you're feeling, be able to label that emotion. How am I feeling right now? Am I feeling sad? Am I feeling morose? Am I feeling happy? Am I feeling content? Am I feeling relaxed? Learn to identify the emotions that you're feeling. Ask for perspective and feedback to see how you're coming across from other people. And if you're, if you're criticized, take that as a learning opportunity. What is it these people saw that's making them you know, feel that way? I didn't, definitely didn't intend to come across that way. And if you hurt or offend other people, apologize unless you intended to hurt or offend them, right? So, oh, I'm so very sorry. I didn't mean to offend you. This was my intention. Learn to read the emotions of others. This one, some people are better at it than others, but from their face, from their expression, from their body language, you should be able to read how they're feeling. Practice that. Interrupt your automatic reactions. Not all the time, but in situations of high stakes, in situations where there is, there's a high possibility for misunderstanding, in situations where the people you're engaging with are different from you, interrupt your automatic reactions. And we're gonna work a bit on that today um, so that you can allow your prefrontal cortex, your thinking brain to engage and choose the wisest reaction. Stop and think before you react. Try to understand the why behind other people's feelings and behaviors. Why are they behaving this way? There must be a reason, they're not crazy, right? And then practice, practice, practice. Emotional intelligence is something that we can work to improve. Okay, so let's get started with this week's course, moving forward with EQ, with emotional intelligence. We're gonna do some exercises. Um, I had wanted to do a lot more, but I also want to give you the opportunity to ask questions. So we'll limit the exercises but the objective is to give you the opportunity to practice increasing each of those five competencies. We've worked a lot on self-awareness and we've done some work on self-control. So we won't do too much in those areas. We'll focus on the last three. And this is what we're going to do. 
So for self-awareness, I've talked about the assessments. So we're going to become more socially aware, more aware of ourselves within a social context. And then in terms of self-control, I'm going to introduce some of you to the ladder of inference, which many of you will be familiar with. Um, it's a, it's, the ladder of inference is how we process um, what we observe and what we see in our minds very, very quickly, okay? And then we'll talk about prioritizing for self-motivation, prioritizing what is important, setting our goals. For empathy, we're gonna talk about stereotypical beliefs and attitudes. What do people think about people like you? And what do you think about people like them, right? So that we can practice empathy. And finally, in terms of social skills, we'll talk about building your intercultural competence. Do you remember in our first week, we talked about how we are cultural beings? and how we have so many different identities. So actually, every interaction is a, with, a, with somebody else is an intercultural um, interaction. So how do you build your intercultural competence? And then how to give and receive feedback respectfully, because that's really the issue. When people are different from you and you, tell, you want to talk to them, they might misinterpret what you say. So what can you do to limit the room for misunderstanding or for offense. So that's our program for today. So as usual, we're going to start by introducing ourselves. So please, using the chat box, please uh, let's greet each other, share our names, our current location, and any question that you might have about emotional intelligence or what we have covered in the course so far, just type it in the chat box and the admin will collate so that we can answer these at the end. And I will also introduce myself in the chat. So here we go. Salam alaikum. I am in Lagos. Uh-huh. I can see Faiza is here. Okay, I can see Gasali, Binta from Accra. Hello, Binta. Mariam, Nabila from London. Is that Auntie Nabila? I have an auntie, a Syrian auntie called Auntie Nabila. I think that might be her. Um, got called from Kaduna, from Ibadan, from Abuja, from Okota in Lagos. Excellent. So, what questions? No questions yet. Okay, let's just keep introducing ourselves and get to know who's in the room. Kano, I can see Kano as well. Let's keep introducing ourselves. And then if you have any questions, please put them into the chat. So let's go on. Become more socially aware. This is what we're going to do. We're going to become more socially aware in stages. So the step, step one is... I'd like you to share what respect looks like where you come from. Somebody is calling from Chicago. That's great. So where, what does respect look like where you come from? Please type it in the chat box. What does respect look like where you come from? Where I come from, respect is once you're an adult, all adults treat you as if you have the same status as them. So equal status, where I come from equal status in adulthood. That's what respect looks like, where I come from. What does respect look like where you come from? Okay, Kabira has said it means obedience to authority. All right. So for me, it's equal status in adulthood. For Kabiru, it's uh, obedience to authority. Someone else, what does respect look like where you come from? Giving an individual their right Okay, excellent. All right. Uh, oh, someone else. That's Abdul Rahman Yenusa. Always listening to the figures of authority. Okay. Bom has said, uh, respect is to obey, greet, and submit to elders. It may require bowing or kneeling down to greet. All right. So I can see, you can see so far. So from what respect looks like where I come from, which is equal status to adults to 
Um, obeying and greeting and submitting to elders, it might include kneeling down. Okay, so a lot of you are saying it, it's a respect is about um, giving due, I don't know, giving their due to the elderly. A lot of you have said that. Treating others the way you want to be treated, regardless of being adult or young. Okay, so someone else, Ghania is saying, treating anyone older with reverence. Okay. Uh, someone else said, heeding to people's words irrespective of your personal thoughts. So controlling your personal thoughts and heeding to other people's words. Okay, let me introduce you to a concept. Let's keep that going. And I'd like all of you, someone, Naeem has said, respect means being submissive. So I want to introduce you to the concept of false friends. False friends are concepts that we assume are universal when they are actually very, very different. And one of those false friends is respect. That word respect is in every single culture, but it means something different in each culture. For in some cultures, it means we are equal. Once we're adults, I'm no longer a child. You have to treat me the same. You treat me the same way I will treat you, irrespective of age. Whereas in another culture, in many cultures, according to your, your, what you've shared here, it's the elders who are due respect. They're the ones who are due respect, not everybody. And you must submit to them and show them reverence, okay? And then in some other cultures, respect means eye contact, looking someone straight in the eye when you're talking to them. Whereas in some cultures, it's averting your gaze, looking down or looking to the side, not making eye contact is showing respect. So respect is a false friend. It causes a lot of misunderstanding because we all think we're talking about the same thing. So another false friend in our community is called the practicing Muslim. So what I'd like you to do now, I'd like you to share in the chat box who is considered a practicing Muslim, where you come from. What does a practicing Muslim look like, sound like? How does a practicing Muslim behave? Or wh where do they work? Or how do they dress? Okay, who is considered a practicing Muslim where you come from? Let's share that. Okay, so let me start with mine. Where I come from, a practicing Muslim is someone who um, obeys the five pillars. Someone who obeys the five pillars of Islam. Okay, so that's what a practicing Muslim looks like from where I come. Someone else says, someone who prays five times a day. So you might not see the person praying, right? But you know that that person prays five times a day. So that person is a practicing uh, Muslim. Another one says, someone who doesn't drink alcohol or eat pork. So apart from the five pillars, you also don't do what is considered haram. You don't consume what is considered haram. That is a practicing Muslim. For someone else, it's someone who's regular at the mosque and doesn't take alcohol. Someone who, are up here, I hope you can read the chat. I hope you're reading the chat along with me, right? Someone who follows the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet. So for some people, a practicing Muslim is someone who tries, if you're a man, you try to dress and groom yourself the same way, the way the Prophet did peace be upon him. Okay, you're following the Sunnah. Um, someone else is whose action, who avoids major sins, but you may not know. And for someone else, someone who wears the hijab is a practicing Muslim. So I just want you to become aware of the, of these definitions. You can see that our definitions are all very different. So you might look at someone and not think that they're a practicing Muslim, but as far as they're concerned, they are. And then some other people, a practicing Muslim doesn't even have to show any sign, and no outward sign that they are Muslim at all. As far as they're concerned, they pray five times a day and they, they, uh, they read the Quran, they're a practicing Muslim. So it's important that we realize that our own perspective is not the only perspective. There are many beliefs about what a practicing Muslim who is considered a practicing Muslim in the community. And it depends on the community that you come from. So 
in terms of self-awareness, that's something you also have to realize. The way you see yourself may not be the way others see you. And the way you see others may not be the way they see themselves. And it's very critical in terms of your engaging with them, your interaction with respectful interaction with them and your relationship building. Thank you to everybody for making your contributions. So in the multicultural settings, and I think we've established that any setting is a multicultural setting because we're all so different, right? Assume difference. Assume that everybody is different. Don't assume we're all the same. Assume that everybody is different. It will make you communicate in a different way. You have to understand yourself and your own subjective culture. So that's why last week I asked you, what is a proverb that you learned as a child that you still resonate with you as an adult? That proverb is part of your subjective culture. It's personal to you because other people who didn't, who didn't grow up where you grew up don't know that proverb and they don't live according to that proverb that you live according to. Okay. And, you know, remember that we often harbor this unconscious fear that if we empathize too much with another culture, if we're too tolerant or understanding about another culture, we might lose our own identity. But we have already established two weeks ago that we have so many identities and it's not that easy to lose your identity. The fact that you can acknowledge someone else's culture it does not take anything away from your own culture. It just gives you, expands and widens your repertoire of how to behave in a different setting. I could just spend a whole class discussing this, but let's move on to self-regulation. Self-regulation is about blocking, controlling your emotions, being in control of your emotions, which includes suspending judgment and preventing your automatic reactions from taking control. So I'm going to introduce you to a concept called the ladder of inference by taking you through this real life adventure. So you can see a group of sisters here talking and one of them asks the other sister, Salams, are you busy this weekend? I think it's a very innocent and straightforward question, right? What goes on in the other sister's head when she hears that question, that innocent question, Salams, are you busy this weekend? Hmm, why is she asking me? Does she want me to work this weekend? Maybe she has an invitation to the big event this weekend that she can't use and she wants to give it to me. Or maybe she just wants to know if I'm busy enough to come in. Or maybe I'm about to lose my job. Maybe the company is about to downsize. Our brain is a remarkable computer. And in a millisecond, from a simple, innocent question, it can come up with multiple scenarios. Many of them have no bearing on reality. All she asked was, are you busy this weekend? How did your mind go to maybe the company is about to downsize? Okay, so this is what happens in our brains. We hear something, we see something, and our brain quickly, 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 quickly comes up with a multitude of scenarios and then we react. So if she decided, maybe does she want me to work this weekend and I don't want to work, and she asked me, am I busy this weekend? I might reply, oh yes, I'm very busy when I'm not busy at all, right? So from all those scenarios and from the scenario that you select, your imaginary scenario in your head that you select, you will take some action you will react, you will make a statement, okay? Which might close some doors for you that might have been open. She might, she might have been asking, are you busy this weekend? Because there was an opportunity for you that you've been angling for and you've closed that door. So let me explain exactly what happens. It's called the ladder of inference. I'm gonna start from the bottom. We start from the bottom. You observe data and experiences. So let me give you a personal story. Um, I do a lot of training and I don't normally cover my head when I'm at work. I work in circular offices and all my colleagues know me as their trainer and they like me as their trainer. 
And one day, it was Friday, and I normally, I have my um, abaya that I put on when I'm going to the mosque. Normally, I have time to put it on just before going to the mosque. But that particular Friday, because of where we were going to be, I knew I wouldn't have time. So I wore it when I was going to deliver my training. Okay? So this is what was happening. The, my staff, my colleagues, observed me coming into the training room with my full abaya on and my headscarf, which I don't normally wear. They selected some data. What did they select? They selected what I was wearing, the abaya and the headscarf. That's what they selected. They added meaning to what I was wearing. The meaning they added was Habiba has become a, a religious fundamentalist. Okay? That was the meaning they added from seeing the way I was dressed. They made some assumptions based upon that. She won't be Habiba now that she's a religious fundamentalist. Habiba will not be relaxed and easy and open with us the way she used to be before. They drew some conclusions. This training will be a waste of time. And remember, I'm telling you that I've been training these people for years, right? And they adopted beliefs about the world that a religious fundamentalist cannot give good training. It will be a waste of time. And then they took some actions. And let me tell you the actions they took. Some of them got up and walked out of the room. These are colleagues who know me very well and they like me. Some got up, left the room. Some opened their computer, started working. Some just sat back like, let me prepare for one hour of boredom. None of them asked me, oh, Habiba, you know, this is strange. You don't normally dress like this. What is happening? They did, what they did was they climbed up the ladder of inference very, very fast. Okay. Now, if they had, yes, observed what I was wearing, they paid attention to the fact that I'm, I'm dressed for, as a conservative Muslim, and their meaning could even have been that, yes, Habiba has become a religious fundamentalist. Before making the assumption, they could have asked me a question. That, oh, Habiba, have you become a religious fundamentalist? And I'd have said, no. Why does what I'm wearing mean that I'm a religious fundamentalist? I don't think you know I'm a practicing Muslim. You know, I didn't have time. I won't have time to change if I go into the mosque. That's why I've worn it. I go to the mosque every Friday. And that would have been the end of that. We'd have continued the training as usual. So this process of quickly processing information, adding meaning, making assumptions, drawing conclusions, adopting a belief about the world and taking action based on this belief, which was based on false conclusions, which was based on erroneous assumptions, which was based on subjective meaning, is something we do all the time. A, 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 a classic example is somebody walks past you, somebody you know very well walks past you and doesn't greet you. Okay, you observe somebody walking past you that you know. What you decide to focus on is that they don't greet you. You don't focus on, did they see you? You don't focus on, do they seem distracted? You don't focus on, are they wearing their glasses or not wearing their glasses? You focus on, they didn't greet me. And the meaning you add to that is, this person is disrespectful. This person has decided that they're bigger than me. This person is being rude. And the assumption is, you know, um, the assumption you could do is, this person is longer, no longer my friend. And the conclusion you're going to draw is, Okay, no problem, we won't be greeting each other anymore. And the belief you're going to adopt is, when somebody you know walks past you without greeting you, that means your relationship has ended. And the action you take, the next time you see that person, you don't greet that person. And the person will be like, what happened? Okay, so this is the ladder of inference. And this is the way we all process information and things that happen to us and things that we see in our minds like this. It happens in a millisecond. So just like with the amygdala hijack, 
we need to make sure we interrupt. We can add meaning, yes, but before we make an assumption, we need to interrupt. And I'd like to refer us um, to this narration that the prophet peace be upon him said, beware of suspicion for suspicion is the worst of false tales and do not look for others faults and do not spy and do not be jealous of one another and do not desert or cut your relationship with one another and do not hate one another and oh Allah's worshippers be brothers as Allah has ordered you. Beware of suspicion, for suspicion is the worst of false tales. And for me, this really underlines what happens to the ladder of inference. So with emotional intelligence, just like we tell you to block your automatic reaction, we also tell you to keep yourself low on the ladder of inference. How do you keep yourself low on the ladder of inference? You do it by suspending judgment. You observe something. When you observe a situation, keep an open mind. The situation might not be what it appears to be. It might be what it appears to be, but it might not be what it appears to be. There may be more to the situation than meets the eye. Keep an open mind. When you select and focus on data, be aware that there are many other things you could have focused on, okay? Be aware that there are many other things that you are focused on. And when you add meaning to the data that you've selected, okay, accept that there may be alternative meanings to the one you have chosen, okay? So verify, um, my friend, you just, didn't you see me standing here? You just walked past me, you know, without really greeting me. I mean, have I offended you? Oh, 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 I'm so sorry, I'm not. I'm, I, my mind was a thousand miles away. It's been a, such a hectic week. How are you? Good morning. So lovely to see you. Most of the time, that is exactly what happens. Misunderstandings get nipped in the bud. So you do add your meaning. But before you make your assumption, verify with the other person that the meaning you gave is correct. Before you make your assumptions, suspend your judgment and verify. You can say, well, okay, I mean, I'm just assuming that you, I assume that you, you didn't want to greet me and that uh, our relationship is over. Is that the case? The person will say, no, 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 definitely not. And even if you do adopt a belief, remember that your beliefs are not necessarily the truth. They are simply your own beliefs and they are true for you. Somebody else may believe something completely different. So I'd like to enjoin everybody to try and stay low on the ladder of inference. When something happens and you add meaning, think back to the first week of our course, when we talked about how external stimulus comes in and we add meaning, our brain adds meaning to what happens. It's our brain that decides what the meaning is. So if somebody slaps you, remember, we, talked, we used the example of a slap, if somebody slaps you, it's our brain that tells us whether the slap means disrespect, whether the slap means the person is a crazy person, you know, or whether the slap is to wake you up because it's your brain that will tell you. So depending on your background, your brain will assign a different meaning. So seek alternative explanations. And if you have any questions about this, or if you have any challenge, especially if you disagree, please put it in the chat, okay? Look for as many alternative explanations for a person's behavior as possible, especially if the interpretation you've given means that the relationship will be broken, will be damaged. If the explanation you have accepted means that the relationship will be damaged, try to look for alternative explanations. Try to live by the golden rule. You know, do unto others as you would like them to do unto us, right? Which in Islam, we say, none of you is a Muslim until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. But when you're dealing with people from a different culture from yours, it's very important to also deal with them as they would like to be dealt with. It's called the platinum rule. Do unto others as they would like done to them. The way you would like somebody to engage with you may not be the way they would like somebody to engage with them. 
And I've got some contributions in the chat from LA. Another useful hadith is the one on making 69 excuses for the person before reaching a conclusion. Thank you very much, absolutely. Um, Khadija is saying how to control mindset that always think, how do you control mindset that always think negative of future situations? So that's what we're talking about in terms of emotional intelligence. People with high emotional intelligence have excellent, have superior relationship management skills. So if your view of the situation is going to mean damaging relationships, it can be damaging relationships even within your immediate family, try to seek for alternative explanations. That's what people with high emotional intelligence do. They seek alternative explanations. So they don't, the first step is not to damage the relationship. So um, I'd like to take one or two comments on this before we move on, because I think it's very important. I'd like somebody to share a situation where something happened, you made an assumption, you reached a conclusion and you took action. You adopted a belief and you took action. And later on, you discovered that you were completely wrong. Later on, you discovered that you were completely wrong. I'd like somebody to share an example of when that happened. And please, if you're sharing an example, please be very, very brief. Who would like to share an example of when they climbed the ladder of inference very, very fast? and later realized realize that they were wrong. Alabi Olubenga says he has one. Okay, please unmute yourself, Alabi Olubenga. Or I can ask one of the admin to unmute you if you can't unmute yourself. Let's do this very quickly. Please give us an example of, just give us your example. Please go ahead. Hello. Yes, salam alaikum. Why, Salam? Um, good evening. It was um, I'm a resident, and um, I there was a time when I first started residency. I I'm a resident in pathology, and we do autopsies, we sign up cases, histologies, and the like. Yeah. So I just observed when I said there's a consultant in my unit that when I try to submit my diagnosis, all she does is she makes um she just tells me. Did you show your senior extra this? Did you do this? Did you do that? And I was like, does this woman hate me? And I, I think I concluded that I think um, this woman does not like me. So ever since I take cases away from her, give other consultants to get them signed out. But later I now found out that um, it's not really that she hated me. She wanted me to do more. And, okay. uh, and I, I can tell you confidently now that the two of us, we are one of the best of friends in the department. She's a consultant, I'm a junior resident. And even I've assisted her in so many things. And if I have issues now, I go back to her and she get them sorted for me. Thank you. That's a perfect example. Thank you so much. Perfect example. So please mute yourself again. And let me move on to self-motivation. So we talk about uh, self-awareness. We've talked about self-regulation or self-control. Let's go on to self-motivation. And for this one, I need all of you to have your pen and paper ready to take notes because I'm going to be asking you questions that you need to respond to. This is about prioritizing what's important and setting goals. Like people with high emotional intelligence, the classic example that I knew was a lady I spoke to who wanted to own her own pharmacy. And she was working in a big she wanted to own her own retail pharmacy and she was working in a big pharmaceutical company. So they are the ones who sell drugs to retail pharmacies and some of them make drugs. And she had a nasty boss and she was sure that this boss wanted to drive her out of the pharmacy. In fact, several of her colleagues had left. She was the last of the, pe of the people who came in and she was speaking to me about it. And I told her, you know, what are her options and so on. And she said, oh, you know, the guy is terrible. He makes my life miserable. I dread going to work and everything, but nothing is going to make me leave that place. And I said, why? And she said, oh, because I want to own my own retail pharmacy. To own my own retail pharmacy, I have to do work in a pharmaceutical company. I need to understand how that works. Then after this, I'm going to go and work in a, a retail pharmacy chain so I can learn the retail side of it. So this is an essential part of my training if I want to... Um, achieve my goal of owning my own pharmacy. 
So because she had set her goal of owning her own retail pharmacy, she did not allow herself to react to the you know, terrible treatment she was getting from her boss because she knew where she was going and she knew that she needed to be there to stay on the path to get to where she was going. Imagine if she, she didn't have, she hadn't set that goal for herself. She would just like, decided like the others, I can't take it anymore. This sort of disrespect, harshness, treatment, not, lack of appreciation for all my hard work. And she would have left. And what would that have done to the trajectory of her life? What would that have done to the trajectory of her life? She was going in that direction. And because she decided this boss is, is too hard for me to work with and she leaves, that her dream of owning a retail pharmacy might have been at an end. And that's what is so important about self-motivation. If you know where you are going, you don't allow life to <laughs> happen to you willy-nilly. Yes, you might have to take some details along the way, but you continue to move in the direction in which you are heading. So the first question I have for you, what are your top three priorities in life in order of priority? What are your top three priorities in life in order of priority? Please write them down. I can tell you what my top three priorities are. Number one is my health. Number two is my family. And number three is my work. So I'm an executive coach. So I've coached a lot of people. Many of them will put number one, God, my faith. Number two, my work or my family. Um, number three, money, making money. Some other people will say, number one, uh, travel and recreation. Number two, my friendships. Number three, fitness. And your priorities can change. Your priorities can change. They don't have to be the same. But right now, where you are right now in your life, what are your top three priorities? For me, I've chosen health first. It's, health has always been my number one priority because I think that if I'm not healthy, I will not be able to do what I feel is my purpose in life. I even feel I won't be able to observe my religion properly. I've seen people who cannot uh, perform salat. They can't bend over and do sujud because they're in bad health. So for me, health is my number one priority. The so second priority is family. You know, meeting my obligations to my family, my nuclear family, I'm a married woman with children, my birth family, and whoever else I've adopted into my family because they're like brothers and sisters to me. Okay, they've shown that they love me and I love them too. And then my third one is my work. So my work is also part of my purpose. My work is also how I earn an, an income. My work is also how I keep my brain sharp. My work is also a way of worship for me. So what are your top three priorities in life in order of priority? Please write them down. Thank you for those of you who are putting them in the chat, but it's also important that you write them down on a piece of paper. I want you to have it for reference. Health, family, business, health, family, my dream, family, health, relationships, faith. Um, a lot of you have said um, peace of mind, faith, life, family, self-discipline, increase in faith, wealth creation. Absolutely. You don't have to apologize to anybody for your priority. It's your priority. So second thing, second question. What are the eight most important areas of your life? that you need to work on to be more satisfied and happy? What are the eight most important areas of your life that you need to work on to be more satisfied and happy? Those of you who got the email from Micah, you got a link to the Wheel of Life and the Wheel of Life had some you know, areas there, but you can select any, actually any areas at all. It's specific to you. For you, it could be your relationship with your romantic relationship might be an important area for you to work on. It might be your health and fitness. It might be your personal development. It might be your spirituality, your relationship with God. You know, what are the eight most important areas of your life that you need to work on to be more satisfied and happy? Write them down. So for me, it would be my relationship with my spouse my spirituality, my relationship with my children, 
my relationship with my family, so important to me, my relationship with my friends, um, health and fitness, um, professional development, I'd say, uh, personal development, my home environment, um, trying to think which other else, of course, finances, of course, finances, financial security. So it doesn't matter what it is. It's, in, as it's what is important to you. Your own eight areas might not be somebody else's eight areas. I'd like each of you to write down what are the eight most important areas that you need to work on to be more satisfied. Okay, so some of them you'll be very satisfied with. You need to work on them to keep them at that high level. Some of them you're very dissatisfied with them and you need to work on them to increase your level of, uh, of satisfaction. But it's really important. It's your satisfaction. It doesn't matter whether somebody thinks you have a good life. As long as you're not satisfied with your life, you will not be happy. Okay? So that's something else you need to be aware of for your motivation. Third question. What do you want to be remembered for achieving in life? and in your work or your purpose? What do you want to be remembered for achieving in life and in your work or purpose? And when I say remembered, it doesn't mean that you have to wait until you're dead. No, it could be when people talk about you. What do you want them to say about you that, oh, Habiba, she was, she is, okay? What do you want to be known for? What do you want to be remembered for in your life and in your work or purpose? And remember, if you're not a working woman, if you are what people like to call a, a housewife, a homemaker, okay? Or let's, let's say many people right now, they're unemployed, okay? There's nothing, when you say unemployed, that means nobody is paying you to do the work that you're doing, but I, you still have work to do every day. Okay, you still have a purpose. So what do you want to be known for? What do you want to be remembered for in your life and in your work and in your purpose? Please write it down. And a final question. What role does your faith play in your motivation? And I'd like you to answer this question in the chat. What role does your faith play in your motivation? So for me, I'm going to write down, it gives me um, adhering to the principles of my faith, gives me peace of mind and confidence uh, that my life is in good hands. Okay? For Aminu, he said inheritance for my children, Islamic projects for Muslims and philanthropic things. Alabi has said, my faith gives me a leverage to always do more. Yeah. Uh, Wahid says, it makes me believe that all that happens is from Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Plus, thus I have peace of mind. It keeps me going on the right path. It gives me the strength to go on, absolutely. It guides my steps. We're talking about motivation. It gives me the strength to go on. It guides my steps. It re re reassures me. It reinvigorates me. It gives me strength to carry on. It, it, it keeps me hopeful and optimistic. It helps me strive for excellence in everything I do. Alhamdulillah, that's fantastic. Fantastic, you know? Honestly, we really thank Allah for um, for Islam, you know, look at what it's doing for all of us. Look at what it's giving to all of us. Mashallah. It gives me a sense of direction. So we sent this link. If you didn't have the opportunity to do it before, the link is right here. It's very, very simple. Um, um, Quadri, if you don't mind, can you just post this link in the chat? Because it's an exercise that if people can do. It just takes two minutes to do this exercise. You go to this website. It will ask you to rate your level of satisfaction in each of these areas. And it will come up with this diagram for you. And this diagram is called the wheel of life. And it's supposed to represent the wheels of the car. Your, your life is a car 
and the wheels are what your car is riding on. And if this is the shape of the wheel that your car is riding on, you can imagine how uncomfortable your experience of life will be. So what you want to do is that you want to try to balance the wheel, you know, try and make it smoother, try to have overall satisfaction, um, not, not very high, definitely not very low. We want to smoothen out the edges, work on the areas that are too low, but are important to you. Try and work on improving them so that your experience of life, your journey through life will be smoother, will be a smoother ride than it is right now. The Wheel of Life is a visual representation of how comfortable or uncomfortable your journey through life is because of your level of satisfaction with each of the important areas of your life. So we have a question here. Can the goal setting questions be used in setting one, setting one values? Absolutely. I just decided not to go into values because of time, but absolutely you should use them in setting your values as well. You know, when we ask about what are your top three priorities, you should also talk about what are your top three to five values. You should. And then after you've written everything down, you then look at how am I spending my time? So do a time management exercise. I'd encourage everybody to go online, look for, um, there's some online time management assessments that you can do. Do the, the online time management assessments, the importance and ur urgent and important matrix. Do that, print it out, look at it and overlay your values on it and say where I'm spending the, the bulk of my time. Is it tied to my top three priorities in life? Is it tied to one of the eight important areas of my life? Is it aligned with my values? And where anything that on that matrix, on that um, urgent and important time management matrix that is not linked with either your priorities, your important areas, or your values, eliminate it from your life. Unapologetically, just eliminate that activity. It's a waste of your time. So definitely you should do that. Okay, so empathy, understanding the emotional state of others. We talked a bit about this. Um, so we don't have a lot of time. So I'm, we're gonna do this together. I wanted us to do this as a breakout group, but we're gonna do this together. What are the general beliefs that other people have regarding people like you? What are the general beliefs that people have regarding people like you? Can you, um, I'd like somebody to write, to write in the chat, what are some general beliefs that people have about people like you? What type of people do they think you are actually? Okay, so what do they believe about, about you? So let me think. Um, I was, I once told somebody I was a Muslim, someone found out I was a Muslim and they said, oh, they, they couldn't believe I was a Muslim, that they didn't think Muslims were accomplished. So let me just put it here. Let me just put it here. What do they believe about people like me? They believe Muslims are not accomplished. Or should I say exposed? Okay, someone else said that Muslim women should not be vocal. Okay, not be vocal. All right, so some, someone said, because I'm hijabi, they think I am shy and not confident. Yes, okay, hijabi women are shy and confident. Okay, that's what they believe. What else? Yes, I'm a liberal woman. They think I'm liberal because I'm toler tolerating and understanding. Okay, so they believe only liberal Muslims are tolerant, okay, and understanding. Let me just put that, and understanding. Okay, yes, they are surprised that I am brilliant, somebody said. <laughs> it's remarkable, it really is. Okay, so, and if they believe all of this, what is their attitude and behavior towards you? This is what they believe. What is their attitude and behavior towards you since this is what they believe about you? Okay, so the ones who, um, for me, they are confused, you know. 
the attitude, their behavior towards me and the attitude is that they're confused about me. For some other, someone said they are reluctant. Okay. Someone else said what? Keep, keep it coming, keep it coming. If they believe Muslims are not accomplished, Muslim women should not be vocal, hijabi women are shy and confident, only liberal Muslims are tolerant and understanding, what is their attitude and behavior towards you? What is their attitude and behavior? Okay, maybe they, 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 some have said they're incredulous. Okay, they can't believe it, right? And what else? Another one, condescending. Condescending. Okay, in fact, some are jealous. So jealous, you know. Others think their attitude. They think I'm difficult and cold. They're always surprised. Okay, very surprised because they think you would be difficult and cold. All right. And if this is what they believe about you, you know they believe this about you. And this is their attitude and behavior towards you. How do you react towards them? How do you behave towards them in return? knowing what they believe about you and what their attitude and behavior is, how do you react and behave towards them in return? What's your reaction to them in return? Okay, you said they disassociate from me. What do you do towards them? What do you do towards them? You said disassociate. Associate. Didn't spell that right, but never mind. How do you believe towards them since you know that this is what they believe? Let's start thinking about us. Okay, I make excuses for them. Okay. You make excuses for them. Okay. What else? For me, when they believe I'm not accomplished, Muslims are not accomplished, they are confused, they are surprised, I stay away from them. I stay away from them. I don't get close to them. You know, someone says I warm up to them. Okay, I warm up to them and explain. Yeah. But for me, I find all this condescending and all the rest. I don't like it at all. Um, so I think people who are close minded like this, I don't have time for them, you know, but so, some of you are being better than me. Someone says, I, I be an, uh, I'll be an example. <laughs> okay, someone else says, I don't entertain such rubbish. <laughs> I don't entertain such rubbish. Yes, okay. So absolutely. So this is, the, that, that is the situation, right? So this is what I'd like you to do. Um, we're gonna go into a breakout group now. And in that breakout group, what I'd like us to do, let me stop annotating. What I'd like us to do in our breakout groups is discuss these things. Oh my goodness. Let me get rid of this annotation. Okay. In our breakout groups, I'd like us to discuss these things. Okay. Um, the beliefs they have about you, are they true? in your opinion, okay? And then what impact do these beliefs and the resulting attitude and behavior have on your relationships? And what impact and results do they have on the workplace and your community? And finally, um, strange, what happened to number three? And finally, how do these beliefs prevent or promote collaboration and teamwork towards goal attainment? How do these beliefs prevent us from getting together as a community or getting together as an organization or getting together as a team or a department to achieve a common goal? So please take notes because in the breakout groups, you're not gonna be able to see this slide. I'd like you to answer in your breakout groups, the beliefs that people have about you, are they true? Do you consider them to be true? How accurate are those beliefs? Two. Knowing that they believe that, what impact do those beliefs have on your relationships and on the workplace and community? And thirdly, how do those beliefs prevent you from getting together 
and working towards a common goal with other people. Those are the three things I'd like you to discuss in your workout group, in your breakout groups. We're going to have eight minutes. So I'd like somebody to please, as soon as you enter your breakout groups and you have other people there, I'd like somebody to quickly start sharing and other people make their, their contributions. Please, if you're sharing one minute only, we'd like to hear from as many voices as possible. So please, Quadri, launch the breakout groups. What do people believe about you? What are their attitudes and behaviors? What impact do those have on your relationships? Do you think they're true, those beliefs they have about you? And how do they prevent you or promote you from working towards a common goal with other people? So don't worry, the breakout group is going to launch automatically, Sanusi. So don't worry, it's going to launch automatically. You'll be in the group. So let's get started. Just click join.
So welcome back everyone. I know more and more people are joining us. I hope you had a really valuable uh, discussion about people, how people have stereotyped you, okay? Whether as a practicing Muslim or as a hijabi or whatever it is. What I'd like us to discuss now, and I'd like some of you to unmute your, your mics to share with us is how you have stereotyped other people. That is what I would like us to discuss now. How you have stereotyped other people. The general belief that you have regarding another group of people you have to deal with regularly. That's what I'd like us to discuss now. And I'd like someone to be very, very brave and courageous and honest and tell us about the beliefs they have about alaikum salam that the beliefs they have about another group of people they interact with regularly what are the general beliefs you have regarding another group of people for example when i was working in a multinational there were stereotypes about men from a certain ethnic group oh those men are like this there was a <laughs> Yeah, there's a stereotype about certain women. For well, those women, they just come here to get pregnant and to find a husband and to get pregnant and that's it, they're not here to work, okay? So what are the stereotypes, the general beliefs that you have regarding another group of people you have to deal with regularly? And I'd really love it if you could share because just as people stereotype us, we also stereotype other people. And for self-awareness, and for um, social awareness, it's really critical that we understand what we are doing to others while we're complaining about what others are doing to us. So who's going to share? You can put it in the chat box. Hi. Okay, okay. chat box. Aisha, hi, yeah. You can, put it, you can share. Okay. All okay. right, um, I normally basically stereotype people according to their dressing. Okay. Friends, the kind of friends they keep. Okay. Basically, those are the instant um, stereotypes that I have. The moment I see your dressing, I analyze you. How are you dressed? And immediately I put it in a category, and then I relate it according to those categories. Then okay. otherwise, maybe like somebody who doesn't cover up too much, or she's free with her body, or things like that, or mm -hmm. she's too fashion fashionable. Like, okay, this one is a fashionista, and then I put yeah. her in the category for the fashionista. Unless if you prove to me maybe through your speech or intellect, then I can yeah. say okay. Has been a fashionista, she has something up there. So, also yeah. for the men, where they yeah. dress, I use it to interact and see okay, is this person a serious person? Is, does this person look responsible? And then from there, your behavior, but this the dressing first is the point of um, is the first point of analysis for me. Followed Thank by you speech. so much. Thank you so much, Asha, because that one is that one is very critical. You look at the way a person is dressed, and based upon the, the way they are dressed, you decide how many brain cells they have. <laughs> and and you know, I have met people before socially through their through our social circle who I thought one of them, they're both women. One of them was a football fanatic, and she had her football club in Europe that she followed like crazy. She only talked about football. And the other one only talked about fashion, fashion magazines and things like that. I did not learn until three, four years later that one of them was a top investment banker, one of the, one of the best investment bankers in the country that all these billionaires call, you know? And I just assumed she was an empty headed person because all she used to talk about was football. And the other one, all she used to talk about was fashion. So we can even stereotype people based on their dressing and yeah. not we take the time to get to know them for who they are, which is critical. Can I say something? Can I share something? Okay. So this one has to be very brief because I know uh, Abdul Rashid has given me a time check. Yeah. So we, Can I share? By Maghrib. So very quickly, quickly, Hawa, please go ahead. Yeah. Actually, my own um, thoughts about people is incidentally within the religion. When I see a when I see a fellow sister who overuses the hijab, mm -hmm. I feel I feel oh, can this person actually represent us? In case we have to, we need somebody to go out there and speak for us. Will this person be able to? I I see them as uh, um doing some overcovering, 
-hmm. And at times I try to stay away from them, you know. And I, I always feel, I feel very bad at times when some of them come out. Sorry I'm saying this. I know it may sound um, awful. Some mm -hmm. of them are very dirty and, you know, very irritating. I feel, I, I actually feel I have a kind of stereotype against uh, okay. such things. As... Okay, so I'm, uh, thank you for being Can honest. I say something? Thank you for being honest and sharing this. And Mohammed, the final word goes to you. Please go ahead. All right, so like for me, where I work, I, I usually had this impression about all these rich house girls, that they are lazy, that they can't do anything, you know? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the first time I had one girl come from Abuja and all that, and other people from all over the country to my office, so I was teaching them and training them. Surprisingly, when, I, when they went back, I gave them task. She was the first to, to, um, to finish her task. Yes. Right, to the point that she knew that I had looked down on her because she was like talking. And then she talked eh, 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 eh. like, man, this one is some real spoiled brat. So, mm. but she really put me wrong. She really earned my respect. So after okay. that time, she even mentioned it. She's like, you think that I'm, I can't do my work? You think I'm lazy? <laughs> I couldn't respond, but when she gave me her work, I, since that time, I speak to her with respect. Yeah. So I'd like to say, I'd like to ask each of all of us, and thank you very much, you know, for those of you who've been very, very honest about this. We need to have these kind of honest uh, conversations because those stereotypes exist. You know, a stereotype is just like the amygdala, it's just like our fight and flight response, our survival instinct. The stereotype is part of our survival instinct. It's when we don't have information and we enter into a situation, you don't have information. You have to quickly assess where is the danger? Where is the danger? That is the, that is the reason your brain establishes stereotypes. It's looking out for what can be a, a, of danger to you, which is why it's very rare for stereotypes to be positive. It's very rare to have a positive stereotype. Stereotypes are normally to alert you to where there is danger. So if you are not in an emergency situation and you meet somebody, get to know that person as an individual. Get to really know that person as suspend judgment and get to know that person as an individual. And you will find out that your relationships flourish because a lot of the misunderstandings that arose because of those wrong beliefs that you had about that person, which led to you to having funny attitudes and behaviors towards that person will just melt away. So thank you very much to everybody who made their contributions. And finally, social skills, managing relationships with emotional intelligence. Um, I wanted to talk to you a bit about harassment and discrimination, but we don't really have time because I want us to have a question and answer session. So I'm just going to show you the, the quick videos. Um, and then um, if you have questions about this, I will take them in the question and answer session. So basically in harassment, workplaces can be very hostile places. They can be. And you need to be able to use wisdom to engage in workplaces. And there are normally three parties in any harassment incident. There's the person who's doing the harassing, who we call the offender. There's a person who is suffering the harassment, who is called the offended. And that's the person that sometimes makes a complaint. And if you think about what's happening in Nigeria right now, the state of emergency against sexual and gender-based violence and rape, okay? These are the people making the complaints. And then you have the observers, people who know what is going on, either because they have witnessed it or because the person suffering it has come to them on several occasions, complaining, crying, and things like that. So there is a role for each of these three people, the person doing the harassing, the person being harassed, and the observer in making sure that we have good relationships and we have respectful workplaces and communities. So I'm gonna show this video very, very quickly. I hope it works. If it doesn't work, I'll move on. And then, um, let's see. Yes. Can you see, can you see this? research can you see this? so come on guys we are on this proposal together and you guys are speaking vernacular i don't understand it so please speak english i beg okay let me start it again 
Just a second. Eh, bo se je nsin e ma lo sun internet lati pari research lori ise yen so ti yen de ni won sha din ti e ko gbogbo ohun ta ti ko jo ko fi pari proposal tan so e ko si wa la eh to ti da bi so ti proposal yan ba ti ready yan ma gbe lo fun agave ah bo se ko je ni e ko si tan come on guys we are on this proposal together and you guys are speaking vernacular i don't understand it so please speak english i beg no hear word You want to tell me that since you've been in Lagos, you don't know how to speak your Uba? Kofile, Muni. Well, I didn't even know. What we just said is that you're very beautiful. Eh? I'm very. Eh, so, what's your name? What's your name? Eh, Shari Magbabio. Who's the proposal? Who's the name? Okay, and the next one. Good morning, sir. Zenabu, come here. What is good about the money? What have you come to do here? I hope you're not carrying any bomb under this your big masquerade gown. Before you come and bomb us all here, Mrs. Osama. Can you even do any work? I'm sure it's very hot in there now. I beg go before you come and blow me here. Go, please. Zenabo, Zenabo. So these are some of the things that um, we're forced to deal with in the workplace. And it's very, very important that you know how to engage with people and give people feedback when you are offended. And if you are somebody who somebody comes to you to tell you they don't like what you are doing, please stop what you are doing. They are hurt by what you are doing or what you are saying. It's really important that you know how to respond to that feedback as well. So in giving feedback, and please note this down, although I will share the slides with all of you, Try to use a desk acronym when you're giving feedback. When you tell those jokes, when you talk to me about my how I dress, my conservative dressing, express how you feel using I. I feel hurt. It makes me feel scared. It makes me feel nervous. You know, I don't like it. What you want to do is avoid saying you. You make me feel you did. Okay. If you say you, you are attacking the person. The person will go on the will go on the defensive and the person will stop listening to you. So use I, when you do this, when you said this, when that happened, I felt hurt. I didn't like it. It made me nervous. It made me scared. S, specify what you would like. Please, next time, you know, let's keep our relationship professional. Please don't refer to my dressing. Please be respectful of my personal choices. You know, let them know exactly what you would want. And finally, C, state the consequences if they don't change you know otherwise i might have to report it to hr otherwise i might have to leave this company otherwise i will stay away from you otherwise i will look at you differently i will lose respect for you okay let them know what the consequence will be if they don't change their behavior and if you are the person that somebody is coming up to you to say they were offended or hurt by something that you did the first thing you need to do is give them a full listening ear. When they say listen first, it means do not interrupt. Even if you feel they're talking rubbish, you disagree with everything they say, let them finish saying everything that they need to say. Don't interrupt. And then if you did offend them inadvertently, it wasn't your intention, apologize. Oh, I'm so sorry that you were offended. Oh, I'm so sorry that you were hurt. You know, that wasn't my intention. This was actually what I was trying to do. Explain. Okay, apologize first and explain unless what you did was deliberate to cause offense and then say what you will do okay now that i know this is what i'll do or now that i know well you just have to learn to live with it <laughs> this is work this is not the playground okay let them know where you stand let them know what they can expect from you going forward and finally thank them for giving me the feedback because i can tell you it's very terrifying to tell somebody something they don't want to hear 
okay so say thank you thank you for telling me i don't agree with you but thank you for telling me or oh, thank you you know i really i really appreciate it you know and if anything else i do anything else i don't like you know feel free to come up to me and tell me so desk and last are very good um models for giving and receiving feedback how are we doing on time not too good i did want us to practice using desk and last but we won't have time to do that so i'm going to share the slides with you and i'd like you to practice at home i've got three um, examples here of situations you might come across the first one is somebody who has body odor a lot of people find it difficult to tell somebody that they have body odor and i have known people who have been sacked because they have body odor and nobody could tell them that they were smelling i mean it's ridiculous how can you lose your job because none of your colleagues or your boss want to tell you that you know your personal hygiene is this is disturbing everybody around you it's not such a big deal so using the desk model you should be able to tell somebody they have body odor without any issues you know uh, my brother my sister you know i respect you a lot you know um you know, we get on very very well there's something sensitive i want to discuss with you i'm telling you because if it was me i'd want somebody to tell me i'm not sure if you're aware of it but you actually have quite strong body odor i don't know what the cause might be but it's quite discomforting you know it's not nice um i've got some deodorant here for you to use but it's good for you to find out here you know take it um, but it'd be good for you to find out what, what is causing it. Could it be that you don't let your clothes dry or you repeat your underwear? I don't know, but it's really important that you work on it because it's going to affect, it's affecting your professional image. You know, people and where we, where we work, our customers have to feel that it's a nice, uh, clean, nice smelling environment. We don't want anybody to be running away from you. So please, you know, try to do something about it. And I hope you accept this message in the spirit in which I am giving it to you. So I've said, described the situation, I expressed how I felt about it, I've told them what, specified what they should do, and I've told them the consequences if they don't do it. So try and find some scenarios and practice giving feedback using desk. And most importantly, if ever somebody is coming to you to tell you something and you don't like what you are hearing, hold yourself back and just listen without interrupting. And if it really was a misunderstanding and you hurt the people, you know, be mature and apologize for causing offense, explain your, you know, what it was really about, thank them for giving you the feedback, desk and last. Okay, so in summary, this is how we're going to close run a roundup now. We did some quizzes in our first two segments. And I didn't give you the answers to those quizzes. So we're going to do the quizzes again. So Quadri, please launch the polls. We're going to do the first one. You're in a meeting. A colleague takes credit for your work. Uh, what should you do? Immediately confront the colleague. Wait until after the meeting to talk to the colleague and warn them not to do it again. Not do anything. God is in control. You know, he's seeing everything. He knows it was your work. Or th publicly thank the colleague for referencing your work and using your work and explain to the people, you know, how you came about doing your research and all the rest of it. So let's complete the poll. What would you do now that you've learned about emotional intelligence, self-awareness, self-regulation, self-motivation, empathy, and um, social skills, relationship management skills, what should you do? Okay. And you have responded with this. Most of you believe you should wait till after the meeting because it's not good to embarrass a colleague and you correct the person so the person won't do it again. A few of you have said you won't do anything, that your work will speak for itself. What is due to you will come to you. And another group, 54% said after the meeting, 41% said publicly thank him or her for using the work that is a good way of, you know, they said people with high emotional intelligence, they know how to express themselves clearly without causing offense. That would be an opportunity for you to express yourself clearly without causing offense. Oh, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, I'm really glad that you, someone was able to find use for my research, you know, when I put it together and so on and so on and so forth. Okay, so 
there is no one right answer. It's all situational. So definitely immediately confront is something you should try to avoid doing unless it's something the person has done before and you've given them many opportunities. But um, try to publicly thank the person for using your work. And if not, if it's not appropriate in that, at that time, definitely the next best choice is wait until after the meeting to talk to the person. Okay, the next one, we can close the poll. We're going to the next one, which is about empathy. Somebody you have helped before has returned with another problem. What, should, what would your reaction be? Is it to feel sympathy, to feel stressed, to investigate, to listen attentively, give them a sympathetic ear, or to take action? What would your reaction be in view of everything we've been through um, in this course, in the course of these three weeks? So I can see most of you are choosing listen attentively. Some of you are choosing investigate. In other words, help the person solve their own problem for next time so they don't come again, okay? But absolutely, I think we can end the poll now. These are the results, 63, oops, 63% listen attentively. Even if you are going to investigate, you should first listen attentively. Listen without interrupting. Listen attentively first before taking any of the other steps. Many of us have empathy, but we don't show empathy when we're trying to solve somebody else's problems. Meanwhile, sometimes all they want is somebody to show them that they care. They might not need you to solve their problem for them, but they might need someone to show them that they care. And how do you show them that you care? By listening, giving them a listening ear, a sympathetic listen ear, listen attentively, and then help them you know, investigate, take action if you can, empathize, if, just stop with empathizing, you know, feeling sympathy if you cannot. Definitely do not feel stressed. It's a blessing that somebody is coming to you with a problem rather than you going to somebody with a problem. Allah has put you in that uh, privileged position. Okay, um, our next poll was you're in a critical meeting in a secular office and you want to say your prayers in time, on time. Critical meeting, they need you there. What should you do? Do you stay in the meeting and catch up later? Do you wait for the tea break and go and say your prayers? Do you excuse yourself at the, at when the time comes for prayers? Do you speak to the organizers in advance so you are know for sure there's going to be a break at prayer times? Or do you try and do your prayer silently on your seat? What would you do? And again, a lot of you are saying, speak to the organizers in advance. Really, if you're in a secular environment, don't make any assumptions. So speak to the organizers in advance. Let them know that what time is the tea break? Okay, can we shift it a little earlier? Can we shift it a little later? You know, is that possible? And if it's not possible, then, you know, wait for the tea break or lunch break and go for your prayers. Um, some of you have said, excuse yourself. We have obligations to our employers. We have obligations to our communities and so on. We have obligations to Allah. And our faith has given us that flexibility. If not, if waiting, you don't have to wait too long or you know when you'll be able to catch up, I don't think there's anything wrong in waiting behind. But if you know there will not be an opportunity, maybe the best thing for you to do is just excuse yourself, go and do it quickly and come back. Ask somebody else to take notes for you. After all, if you had to go to the ladies, you would be, if you had to go and use the, the conveniences, you would get up and use the conveniences anyway, okay? So use your judgment, think it through, and um, may Allah guide us in making the right decision. And... Remember about um, controlling as the two major com uh, emotions that we need to control, our anger and our fear. If you really say you are a person of faith, then rely upon Allah, rely on him. You know, he's all seeing, he's all hearing, we can seek refuge with him. And remember that fear really is about, is worry about something that has not happened yet. Sometimes it's forgetting that everything is all right. We are all so scared right now. Coronavirus, economic impact, and so on. 
But right now, we are all all right. We are all eating. We are all in good health. And, you know, alhamdulillah, our families are okay. So everything is currently all right. Okay, don't allow fear to guide you and force you to make unwise utterances and unwise decisions. If you say you are a person of faith, rely upon Allah. Seek refuge with him. Um, and to close, I'd like to close with this. You know, in, our, in Islam, we're supposed to fulfill our obligations, um, not just to Allah, but also to constituted authority. We're supposed to submit ourselves to constituted authority wherever that is. You know, um, people are depending on us. Our families are depending on us. So we need to raise our self-awareness. Our faith should complement it. You know, it, you know Allah, Islam is supposed to make our lives easier. It's not supposed to make our lives harder. Okay, so learn more about your religion. It allows flexibility. Make your needs known if, they need, if you have needs that are not being met. And don't be rigid. You know, prioritize what is important. For you to prioritize what is important, you have to know what is important to you. Okay, uh, follow the sunnah of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Build relationships. Maintain relationships, sustain relationships, re rebuild broken relationships. Relationships are everything. If you have conflict, resolve it in a peaceful way. Use the desk and last model to give feedback in resolving conflict. And finally, you know, just educate yourself, yourself about your faith. Read, read, read. The first word in the Quran is Ikra. Read, read for yourself. Don't rely on what other people are telling you. Read for yourself. So um, we're going to launch the evaluation poll, and then we're going to take our, have, enter our question and answer session, and we'll round up with that. Uh, we're coming up to Maghrib now. So let's launch the evaluation poll very quickly, and then we'll have the question and answer session. Please evaluate the course so far. How did you find the content? Do you think it was relevant to your personal development? Do you feel the modules were practical? Um, what else again? What was the third one? Okay. Do you feel that I was knowledgeable and responsive? Please be honest. <laughs> because if I get negative feedback, I'll go back and I'll work to improve myself. And did the course meet your personal expectations? Please complete the poll. And while you're completing the poll, if you have any questions, um, if you have any questions that are not already in the chat, please put them in the chat. And Micah would also like to know what other topics and issues you'd like Micah to feature or address. Please also put that in the poll. So any questions you have about this um, course? And I think we can end the poll now. Okay. We share the results. So most of you agree that the content was uh, relevant to your personal development. Most of you believe the modules were practical and you can apply what you've learned. Uh, most of you agree that I was knowledgeable and responsive. Thank you very much. And most of you agree that the course met your personal expectations. Great. So what questions do you have? And what other topics would you like Micah to feature or address? At this point, I'm going to hand over to Abdul Rashid. Abdul Rashid, I'm handing over to you at this point. Oh, by, by the way, I'll share the, the slides with you. I have a whole lot of resources on this slide for you, for those of you who want to improve your emotional intelligence. There's so many resources. I'll send this to you. Um, and remember to try anything you're trying to do. Um, try to do it excellently. Uh, may Allah reward all of us. Um, I mean, I mean, okay. So, Jazakumullah Hairan for your time and um, for your deliv excellent delivery. This journey started six months ago after our Katiba, and you promised that you wanted to deliver something that would be of impact to the Muslim community. Today, you've kept your promise. May Allah continue to make you one of those who keep promises. Amen. Amen. So, and um, please let's all recite Surah to Kautha for um, our dear sister Habiba. Um, 
from her delivery, you know that she, she put her heart into this. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna ta'ina kali kawsa fasali li-rabbi kawala inna sha'ana kawala kawala. Inshallah, next week, um, we'll be starting another series titled um, Unlocking Your Potential. It's going to be another um, three Sunday series by our brother from South Africa, um, Idris Kamisa. Um, for those of you who know him, um, he was in Nigeria in 2005 um, when he visited Mike and IET. So he has graciously agreed to take that session. Um, would also have typed in the chat box, those of you who are interested in being part of MICA, please contact us through those um, channels that have typed into the chat box. And inshallah, we'll be glad to have you. <clears throat> we'll be glad to have you and so that we can continue this good work and um, make society a better place for every one of us. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I don't know. Are you being shy to ask for donations for Micah? Please don't be shy. Oh, yes, please. yes, of course. <laughs> so I think yes, someone's please support, is up. Um, please support Micah. Please support Micah um, by donating um, to us so that we can continue to do this good work and um, support other um, activities that will uplift our community. Great. Yeah, I think someone's um, hand is up. I don't know. Do you want to? Yes, of course, certainly. So, uh, Hussein, please go ahead. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullah. I've had this question in mind from the first section, and I've not probably been able to ask. You okay. talked about people being in different cultural groupings and we see things based on our ethnic groups and uh, family upbringing. So my question is, why should two siblings see the same scenario differently if they are from the same tribe and of course brought up by the same parents so it should mean they have the same family upbringing? Yes. Okay, thank you for that question. Very, very good question. Honestly speaking, um, those of you here at Yoruba, you know what I mean when I say I'm Iya Ibiji. So I'm a mother of twins. So I have twins and I made a big effort, not just me, everybody, I forced everybody around me to, to treat them exactly the same, but I didn't want anybody to feel cheated in adulthood. And even though we treated them exactly the same, they are different. When they were born, one of them smiled, was smiling. One of them smiled a lot. The other one did not. You know, so they were different from birth. So when we're talking about influences, you have your personality, you know, which you got from, you were born with. You have your personality. You have your characteristics. Then there's the upbringing, your, the nurturing. So that's the genetics, right? You have your nurturing environment, which might be the same. But even within that nurturing environment, you also have experiences and no two people will have the same experiences. Like one child might have fallen from a bunk bed and the other child did not. So one of them would have learned to have fear of heights. So you also have to add the layer. So we have our personality we are born with. We have our genetics. We have the nurturing environment. And then we have our experiences and no two people can have the exact same experiences. And then as you grow older, as siblings, you, have, you might uh, have uh, different talents. You might be in different classes. You might go to di study different disciplines. You might have different groups of friends and those groups of friends would influence you in terms of peer pressure. So even amongst siblings, you know, each of us is unique and we really do have to recognize our different identities. And some people are born into Muslim households and some of us associate a part of our identity is our, is our religion. I'm a Muslim. When you talk to them, they say, oh, my name is, I'm a Muslim. And your sibling from that same family might say, my name is, I'm an engineer. They don't identify. One of their strong identities is not their faith. Okay, so even among siblings, we can be very, very different. And it's important for us to recognize that. In fact, if we do have siblings, I don't even have to tell you that siblings are very different from each other. 
and that's why we fight. <laughs> that's why siblings fight so so much, you know, because we are different. We're not the same. If we were the same, we'd understand each other one hundred percent. So I don't have uh, saying I don't know whether that answers your question, but I hope, I hope it does. I hope it does. Um, we have another question from H H and A. Please go ahead. His hand is up. Oh, her hand is up. Please go ahead. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wa alaikum salam. Thank you for this um, beautiful, um, I hope, name lecture. Um, it really resonates with me personally. Um, my question is um, Is heavy human um, capable of being emotionally intelligent? This is something that everybody can achieve. Thank you. Okay. So. I can say that is every human capable of increasing their emotional intelligence? Yes. Okay. I'm not sure if I can answer is every human capable of being emotionally intelligent or can they increase their emotional intelligence? Yes. They can increase it simply by gaining self-control. That's the, actually the biggest part of emotional intelligence. That if you are somebody who are, is easily frightened, you find a way to overcome your fear and before you run you stop you now stop you've learned to now stop and assess is there really danger here before running if you can just find a way to interrupt that your automatic your instinctive responses you have already improved and increased your emotional intelligence that's that's the most important thing then if you through reading through taqwa through study you learn more about yourself through humbling yourself and asking people you know, what am I like? You know, what do I do that you like? What do I, what do I do that you don't like? What do you think I'm good at? What do you think I'm not good at? You raise your level of self-awareness. You are increasing your emotional intelligence. If you identify what you want from life, as opposed to what you don't want, because what most people do is they identify what they don't want. I don't want to be poor. I don't want to be alone. Okay. You want, what you need to do is identify what you want. Is it I want to be wealthy or I just want to have a regular income? Or is it that I want to be surrounded by friends? I want to have children, whatever it is, identify what you want and then start working towards that. If you identify your goals and you start working towards your goals, you have increased your emotional intelligence. And if you try to put yourself in the shoes of other people and understand why they are behaving the way they are behaving, and saying, ah, what would I be, what, what would life, what would I, how would I feel if I was a beggar on the streets? Would I behave the way they are behaving or would I behave differently? If you can put yourself in somebody else's shoes, which is what Ramadan is about. Ramadan is giving us the opportunity, raising our consciousness to understand what it might be like to be deprived. Yes. So if you can do that, that raises your level of emotional intelligence. So there are many things that you can do to become more emotionally intelligent so i'm interpreting your question as can everybody become highly emotionally intelligent uh, i can't answer that question but i can say everybody can work to improve their emotional intelligence and there's a lot in our faith if you are practicing islam properly naturally your emotional intelligence should be increasing and increasing and increasing you know um, as time progresses i hope that answers your question and we have a hand raised from titi Titi, you have a question? Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Wa alaikum salam. Thank you for the for the um, presentation and for helping us to reach into our uh, inner self retriever. Earlier on in the first session, I had asked that um, is an emotional intelligent person authentic? And I think you've shed more light on, on, on the level of authenticity. But still mm -hmm. again, in a situation whereby one is in a leadership leadership role or a political role, how can an emotionally intelligent manage a person, manage um, not um, impacting or affecting other people's emotions, but at the same time staying true to their beliefs, staying true to, them, to themselves? For example, I'm looking at a situation whereby um, maybe someone in the US, a Muslim, is in a higher political um, role and mm -hmm. is asked about uh, supporting um, LGBTQ. Yes. So, as a Muslim, I mean, I, I normally would not support that. 
So, mm-hmm. but I, at the same time, I'm in a role, I'm serving the people, I'm also considering other situations. What, how would an emotionally intelligent person handle that situation? Okay. So actually, I was going to talk about um, leadership and emotional intelligence. So I've actually shared it on my screen so you can look at it. So you've, you've raised two different, uh, several issues. So one about authenticity. So being, con- being in control of your emotions and w- making wise decisions. Remember Solomon, you know, peace be upon him. When people used to come to him with their disputes, he would use his wisdom he wouldn't react the way, in some cases, he wanted to react a certain way, but he would hold himself back and use his wisdom to guide the, what do you call the two parties, to come to a resolution that both of them were happy with. So giving your prefrontal contact, your thinking brain, the opportunity to process information and come up with a wise decision is not being, is not being manipulative. It's being the reasoning human being. That's why Allah gave us brains. We're supposed to use them to think and we're supposed to use our emotions on top of our thinking, you know, to also come with wise decisions. So the other thing you talk about in terms of leadership, which I've shown here, is that there's no single way to lead because you have different types of leaders and the different types of leaders will meet different types of followers. And each follower has to be led in a different way if you want to lead them effectively. And then you have the situation that you are in. So you have the intersection of the leader, you have the intersection of the follower, and you have the intersection of the situation. And you have to use wisdom to decide what is the best way to be in that situation. And then going to the third point you raised about LGBTQ, which for people who don't know is lesbian, gay, bisexual, queer, transsexual, and so on, okay? So yes, Islam and in fact, all the Abrahamic uh, faiths do um, forbid homosexuality. Okay, same-sex uh, relationships. Um, well, not same-sex, same-sex sexual intercourse. Let me just put it that way. But they do not condemn the individuals. It's the act that is condemned. It's not the individuals that, that are condemned. And in fact, if you look into the sunnah of the prophet, peace be upon him, you will see that he had a lot of empathy for people who were clearly um, homosexual. He didn't um, condemn them. Okay, what he condemned was the act of sodomy that you should avoid. Okay, so you should avoid sinning, but the fact that you have a different orientation in itself doesn't make you um, a bad person. And so we have our faith as from our perspective, and then we also have human rights. And I hope most of you are aware that the Human Rights Declaration is, the, is a lot of the Human Rights Declaration, the United Nations Human Rights Declaration is derived from Islam. A lot of it is derived from Islam, okay? So we are all God's children. He put all of us on this earth. We are not there to judge another person. We are there to engage in our own jihad. So if you are in a workplace where they say, we are bringing people to work, whether they are gay or straight or whatever, is not our business. Our business is, can they do the work? Their moral life, okay? Their religious life is their own business. I think if you can try and find that boundary between where your business ends and where their own personal life begins, that might assist you. But there may be occasions to when you are being asked to cross the line. And there I would ask you to use your emotional intelligence. And uh, inshallah, you know, with uh, Allah's guidance, you'll be able to come to a wise decision and a way to navigate your way through. So Titi, I hope that that answer is helpful to you. And I think we'll take our final question which will be from Aminu. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you very much, madam. Um, seriously, I so much appreciate your contribution and also by extension to Brother Abdul Rashid for the good job he has been doing on behalf of Micah. My question is this. Uh, is it not advisable that uh, for emotional intelligence to be as a, as a cause or a kind of a subject uh, from the early days of our educational uh, beginning, rather than when most of us have gotten matured and you know the challenge of you you form an habit over some years and when you get to realize that such habit is not good it's difficult to change because you know it it has really taken a long time in in one's life and to change is not easy but from credo educational system having emotional intelligence it could have actually shaped us better you know to speed up personal growth and societal development thank you Yeah. yeah 
Yeah, thank you very much, Aminu, um, for that contribution. I honestly believe that what has happened is um, in society, we have swung too much towards academic education and the role of the family and the role of the community in educating the child. We've, we've sort of dropped the ball there because in the olden days, at least let me speak for African communities. I can't speak for European communities. In African communities, by the time the, by the, time the village has brought you up, by the time you spelled, spend time with the elders, by the time you spend time supervising the youngsters and so on, you would have learned all these emotional intelligence skills by practice, you know? And the community leadership, there was community leadership of men. There were men's councils, there were women's councils who would adjudicate when issues came and who would bring their own wisdom when issues came. And we would be learning these things as children before we went out to the world. By the time you go out into the world, you are mature, you are already educated, even if you can't read and write. And we have swung so much to this academic education and we've created this void. And this void is what we are now trying to backfill by using things called emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence has always existed. It's nothing new. It's just that we've lost the practice of sharing that this is the wise, the successful way of being in the world. The world is about communities. The world is about societies. The world is about people and relationships with people. That's what the world is about. The world is not about um, performing tasks in a factory, you know, or sending reports out in an office. The world is about relationships and we kind of lost that wisdom. And that's the sort of wisdom that we're trying to bring back with emotional intelligence. So with the state of the world that is in right now, yes, I agree with you absolutely that we should be teaching emotional intelligence at a younger age. And I know that Western curriculums are introducing things like mindfulness. You know, mindfulness is a way of introducing, you know, that self-control, self-regulation and uh, self-motivation. So here in Nigeria and in Africa, you know, and in other developing countries, we need to make sure that we introduce it into our curriculum. If we don't, we need to make sure that in, as a community, we find activities or channels for our children to learn these skills. Or as parents, you know, which is something that COVID has helped us a lot, as parents, as siblings, we spend more time with each other, engaging more in conversations with each other, sharing more wisdom, giving each other feedback. This thing that you did, why didn't you try and do it this way to be better? You know, not that way. Doing it with kindness, not with harshness, you know. Um, and hopefully, you know, we'll come back and build ourselves into whole human beings the way Allah intended us to be, the way children are. You know, we lose it from childhood into adulthood. So that's something that we need to go back and regain our whole selves. So thank you very, very much for all your questions. I'll hand back over to Brother Abdul Rashid. Thank you once again, Matt. So we'll end the session. Please, Matt, remember the slides. Yes. Inshallah. I'll share them with everyone, yes. Okay, thank you so much, Matt. Okay, so I think we're ending the session now. Yes, we have. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to say thank you. It's been wonderful spending these three weeks with you. Uh, please have a great week ahead and please don't let COVID disturb you. The world, is still, the planet still exists. Allah is still there. You know, we are all in his hands, taking refuge in him. And uh, we can be assured that everything will be fine. This too shall pass. And Inshallah. if you've lost your job or lost your or your business is doing badly, other opportunities will come. Definitely. You know, they say everything is, was already written for us. So don't let your fear overcome you. Practice your emotional intelligence. This is your opportunity to read, 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 improve yourself. And uh, I wish you all the very, very best. Inshallah. Okay. Jazakumullah. We wish you safe. Thank you.